imagine that you wake up tomorrow and you're feeling sick. You think it's probably nothing, but a few days go by and you lose your sense of smell. You call your doctor and ask, can I get tested for coronavirus? But before you make it to the testing site, you end up having trouble breathing. You turn to your partner and you say, honey, can you take me to the hospital? But you're worried. What will they do with your children while you're gone? Will there be any medicine that can help you recover? And will there be a ventilator if you need one? You're lucky. If you woke up with the same symptoms in Liberia, you might live eight hours from a hospital and have to walk or take a motorbike over terrible conditions, terrible roads to get there. When you have trouble breathing, you might worry, will I be able to feed my children today if I don't work? And how can I ever pay for care? If you make it to the hospital, you can wait hours to see a nurse and then they probably won't have any medicine to help you. And they almost certainly won't have a ventilator because in Liberia, there are six ventilators, six. And one is behind the gates of the US Embassy. As the coronavirus pandemic surges around the world, for the first time, many people in developed countries understand what it's like to lack access to essential health care. But for people in poor countries, lack of access has always been a problem. One half of the world's population doesn't even have clean water or basic sanitation that they need for effective healthcare systems. Half a billion cannot even get basic healthcare, like a nurse to help them give birth. I believe that every person should have a human right to health because their life is just as important to them and to their children as our lives are to us and to ours. The human right to health is articulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but some reject it because they think that the right can't help them ration scarce health resources. I believe they're wrong. I think that the human right to health does something more important for us. I think it inspires us to think creatively about how we can help people meet those basic health needs. The human right to health gives rise to what I call the virtue of creative resolve. Creative resolve is a fundamental commitment to overcoming apparent tragedy. There's a human rights organization called Partners in Health that helped people get treatment for drug-resistant tuberculosis when people thought that it was basically impossible in poor countries. They demonstrated that good treatment outcomes were possible, and as a result, funding for TB treatment expanded around the world. Partners in Health has creative resolve. Creative resolve requires three things. We must commit, imagine, and act. Here's how we do it. First, we must commit to questioning the argument that we can't help people meet those basic health needs. Consider how Jonathan Mann started the global program on AIDS. From a staff of one, he grew this program to help people in dozens of countries. Mann saw AIDS as a human rights problem that flourished in conditions of poverty, oppression, and gender-based violence that eased the spread of the virus. His commitment was palpable, and when he encountered resistance, he challenged the status quo. So, for instance, he resigned as director of the global program when he thought the general director wasn't doing enough to fight the virus. He also accused the National Institutes of Health of violating human rights because it wasn't doing enough research on a vaccine. Second, to have creative resolve, we need imagination. It's not enough to consider the options on the table. We must put new options on the table. Consider how Raj Punjabi, a doctor in Liberia, overcame the problem of helping people who couldn't get to his health clinic. 
He created the nonprofit Last Mile Health, which trains, equips, and pays people to help people who, are, who need treatment in their villages. His organization is helping people in many countries now get treatment for diseases like malaria and AIDS. Finally, to have creative resolve, we must act. Consider how the global program to eradicate polio declared the African region polio-free on August 25th of this year. The polio campaign was a grassroots endeavor from the start. They had trouble reaching people in remote locations, so they came up with satellite maps to track each house to make sure people were getting vaccinated. They used biological assay surveys to track the virus and followed nomadic populations. They put up posts at bus stations to help people get the vaccine and wrote messages on brick kilns. In India, they created a second national shadow health system of 900,000 workers. And when they encountered resistance, the polio campaign found ways of overcoming it. They've partnered with the military, the government, and community leaders without distinction. For instance, when one man said that the polio vaccine might make his child impotent so he didn't want it, they partnered with the local imam to show the man that the vaccine was safe and effective. The campaign has been so creative and resolute that they've employed town criers to let people know that they were there. They've held parades in the middle of villages. And in Afghanistan, they even gave children their polio vaccine at the circus. My big idea is that we need creative resolve to fight back terrible diseases like the coronavirus pandemic. But there's some limits to this virtue. If something more significant will be lost if we try, or we really can't help people, then we don't have to. So consider a hard case. Some accuse human rights lawyers in Latin America of making things worse when they're litigating to get people access to medicines. They say that they're helping the middle class at some cost to the poor and basic health systems more generally. I believe that when we look at the evidence, it's clear that litigation can help the poor and sometimes helps them quite broadly. But if litigation is making things worse, we should find other ways of helping people. We should commit to fulfilling everybody's human rights to health and fight to help people access essential health services in the way that abolitionists fought to end slavery. The argument that we should have creative resolve is this. When something as important as helping people fulfill their basic human rights and live minimally good lives is on the table, then absent evidence that we can't do that, we should exercise our imagination to help them. There's a lot of psychological evidence that people don't consider their assumptions and don't search hard enough for good solutions to difficult problems. We often assume narrow time frames and tight financial constraints. And hope, hope can motivate us to act. Hope is simply believing that something we desire is possible, if not certain. And those who don't want to help people or don't think that we should probably won't try very hard to do it. But I stress the commitment or positive side of the virtue because there are millions of people who can't access basic health care. And it's not as if we're all, all out there trying to help them as much as possible. We need to try harder, try harder, try harder. Consider how we've used creative resolve to overcome past health crises. By the late 1990s, People in rich countries were living long and productive lives due to antiretroviral treatment for AIDS. But at the same time, people in sub-Saharan Africa were dying in droves. Two million people were dying every year from the virus. Pharmaceutical companies claimed it was impossible to lower the price of treatment. But there was a human rights organization called the Treatment Action Campaign in South Africa that refused to accept this claim. Instead, 
They educated patients to demand access to treatment and litigated for positive change. They shifted public opinion on access to medicines, allowing generic companies to enter the fray and bring prices down from $12,000 per patient per year to something more affordable, $350, allowing millions more to access treatment. The claim that we have to ration scarce health resources is just as prevalent today. We're already rationing personal protective equipment, treatments, and the new vaccine for coronavirus. But it doesn't have to be this way. We must commit to finding better ways to help people. Because although people in rich countries are likely to get a vaccine for COVID this year, 3 billion people in poor countries will likely have to wait years for treatment. Countries' economic strength and not need is going to dictate that vaccine distribution. But it doesn't have to be that way. There's an organization called COVAX, which is a collaboration of countries around the world that are committing to helping people get access to the vaccine everywhere. They invest in and help expand manufacturing and distribution of those vaccines. There will be other pandemics. There have always been other pandemics and there are other pandemics and we need to respond quickly when the next one comes. We also need imagination. There are some fundamental problems for access to medicines that have made getting a vaccine slower than it might otherwise have come. Everyone should endorse the World Health Organization's call for global solidarity, and we should work to reorient the incentives for new pharmaceutical research and development by collaborating rather than competing to produce new medicines. Right now, pharmaceutical companies make the most money by creating drugs that treat chronic diseases of rich patients. So, for instance, they can sell me allergy medicine every day for the rest of my life. That's really lucrative. Instead, we should de-link companies' profits from their sales volumes and tie them to the health impacts of their innovations so that they get rewards for new research and development based on the lives they save and the disability they alleviate. And then we should require companies to put those products in the public domain so any generic company can compete and bring those products to people at the lowest possible cost. We must act. You can join me. You can encourage your country to join or support the COVAX initiative. Or you can donate your time, your money, your energy, your creativity, your resolve to an organization that's fighting for access to medicines. We might not succeed, but we should try. We should be no more willing to be content with policies that help some people while many others suffer and die than we should be to allow some people to die in a shallow pool right before our eyes. We must have creative resolve to fight back COVID and other terrible health problems and ensure that everybody's human right to health is secure. And I wanna leave you with a note of optimism. By the late 1960s, the smallpox virus, one of the worst diseases of all time that killed a third of the people infected, not 1%, a third, was almost eliminated in the Americas when the Soviet Union proposed a global eradication campaign and an American led the effort to eliminate it. The campaign was creative and it was resolute and it found ways of vaccinating people and eliminating the virus when traditional vaccinations weren't working. They came up with ring vaccinations to vaccinate all the people who were around those who were infected, which eventually let them conquer the disease. The fact that smallpox was eliminated globally during the Cold War shows that with creative resolve, anything really is possible. We need the strength to commit, the ability to imagine, and the will to 